Hey everybody, welcome back to Great Northwest Weaponry. This is Thomas, and today we're doing another edged weapon video, uh, talking about the Japanese Type 30 bayonets. We've got a pretty good assortment of them sitting in front of us here. Two were mine, one belongs to my friend Dylan. Actually, it's this one on top here, the last ditch example. And uh, yeah, before we get rolling, I wanted to apologize for the delay between the most recent full-length video and this one. Uh, it is, as I actually think I stated in that most recent video, my intention to keep videos rolling every 10 to 14 days for you guys for full-length videos with uh, shorts in between, but sometimes life just gets in the way. I've been very busy for the last few weeks. I actually haven't made it out to the range in fully three weeks. I'm really hoping that tomorrow I can finally get out to the range and shoot some more shooting content for you guys and just shoot my guns in general. I'm, I'm missing them. But yeah, like I say, stuff just gets busy sometimes. Uh, add to that illness and injury in the midst of it. And uh, yeah, I uh, just haven't gotten to get out for a while. But today we are talking about, again, the legendary Arasaka Type 30 bayonet. Uh, these were initially designed in 1897 to go along with the Type 30 Arasaka rifle. And they did not stop using them until the end of World War II. Production went clear up to 1945. Uh, Dylan's example actually is a 1945 example. Exact dates on these, I don't know. Uh, for the most part, the uh, the last ditch one is the only one that I've got a pretty firm date on. But we do have represented here the three major variations of Type 30 bayonet. There are 18 distinct variations made by multiple brands, or um, uh, I guess uh, manufacturers would probably be the more correct term. Uh, we've got two different manufacturers represented here, and we'll take a closer look at that when we go to the tabletop. This is largely going to be a tabletop video, but yeah, like I said, the Type the Type 30 bayonet, it, it is a, or was rather, a hugely influential design. Uh, the Brits actually copied it, of which led to the U.S. having their own copy of it, uh, the British with the... Uh, the pattern 1907 bayonet initially, which was pretty much a one-to-one -one copy of the one seen in front. Uh, I'll actually grab here, got a pattern 1907 bayonet. As an example, this would be the second variation when they did it away with the hooked quillion. And this actually led to them being produced in America, even a, a variation not too long after 1917, of which we also have an example. Should have probably uh, brought these over here initially, would have made my life a little bit easier. But pattern 1917 bayonet, the biggest difference between the 1907 and the 1917 being the distance from the back of the handle to the barrel ring. 1917 bayonet came from the British creating their pattern 1913 rifle, of which never really only got as far as trials, but was later sent to the U.S. for the P-14 in 303 British, of which the U.S. then rechambered for 30 6 to make the model 1917. Pattern 1907 and 1917 bayonets can be told apart very quickly by the slashes in the grip. Flashes in the grip indicated that this would be for the P-14 or 1917 rifles so that they wouldn't be mixed up. This would also be used on American uh, shotguns in World War I and II. But that notwithstanding, the Type 30 bayonet would remain largely unchanged through all of that time and changes were only made out of necessity later into World War II. The farther into World War II you get, the more crude the bayonet design is. And again, we'll be looking at the small differences very closely when we go to the tabletop, but the first thing that was done away with was the hook, the, the guard was straightened, uh, and then stuff started getting really crude with uh, doing away with the uh, 
blood groove and uh, simplification of the pommel. They got, again, just very crude by the end, but all total, some 8.4 million, give or take, of the Type 30 bayonet were made. So, more than a few. And uh, as I believe we've mentioned in Arasaka demos in the past, to my understanding, all soldiers in the Imperial Japanese military would be issued a Type 30 bayonet, regardless of other armaments. So if you were not even issued so much as a pistol, but you served in the Army, Navy, whatever branch, um, their Air Force as well, from my understanding, you would be given a Type 30 bayonet to be used either in hand-to-hand -hand combat or affixed to the end of your rifle or machine gun, Whatever it may be, they were universally used for all uh, detachable bayonet rifles. There, there is the exception of the Type 44. I think it's called a Type 44, Arasaka, which had its own folding bayonet. But all rifles that had a detachable bayonet, it was a Type 30. So your Type 30 rifle all the way up to your Type 99. Uh, you've actually seen me equip these on both my Type 38 and Type 99 rifles. And uh, hopefully here down the road, we'll be getting Dylan out with his last ditch Type 99, and you'll be seeing his bayonet again in that video. But yeah, it's a lot of history, a lot of time that these were used. It's almost 50 years, like say 1897 to 1945, they were produced, so fully 48 years. Definitely saw a lot of use. It's uh, another one of those situations where, uh, as with most of the stuff in this room, really, love to know what these items had seen in their past, because uh, just a, a lot of history in that 50 years and a lot of conflict that the Japanese were involved in. Everything through the Russo-Japanese War, Sino-Japanese War, World War One, and World War Two, and multiple different invasions that they took part in all throughout World War II. These could have been anywhere. Any any one of these three was probably still in use in World War II. Most certainly the top two here, probably this one as well. So yeah, let's go ahead and transition to a tabletop view and start taking a look closer at some of these very minute differences as well as arsenal markings. We'd mentioned that we have two different manufacturers represented here. So we're just going to start uh, with the early war example and then take a look at the mid-war example. The mid-war and late war examples we have here are the same manufacturer. Though, as you may be able to see from here even, the uh, insignias are much more clearly struck on the mid-war example than the late war example. So, for the early one... Got the stacked cannonballs is what did I often uh, hear it referred to as. And then it looks like an M with an arrow running through it. So the stacked cannonballs is typically going to be Kokura Arsenal. This uh, is a date related thing. So pre-1936, this actually would be Tokyo Arsenal. So it depends on the date whether this is Tokyo or Kokura. And then that what looks again like a capital letter M with an arrow running through it, is National Denki or National Electric. Um, by the way, anytime you hear me use Japanese words throughout this, do not trust my pronunciation of it. It's probably incorrect. Serial numbers printed on the face of the pommel there. And serial numbers on these, by the way, is something kind of worth noting, are not were not matched to guns. They were not made a bayonet for a specific rifle. So if you see someone trying to sell a rifle and bayonet combo as matched bayonet and rifle, they didn't bother with such a thing. If it is match numbered, that is coincidence only. So this first example, this either pre or early war example, is National Denki under Kokura Arsenal supervision. And you'll see a lot of these have more than one marking. Uh, both of these do as well. So your it looks kind of like a figure eight at the tip of my finger on the left side over here. 
that indicates Nagoya Arsenal. And then we've got this sort of triangle with a little symbol in the middle of it. That is Toyota Automatic Loom Works, um, a portion of which would actually go on to become the Toyota that we know today. So this one would be Toyota under Nagoya Arsenal supervision. And same with the last ditch, last ditch example. You can, not as well, but you can still see that it is the same Arsenal markings. Now we talked about some of the differences uh, as time went on. The blade length never changed. They roughly 20 inches overall uh, with a like 15 and three quarter inch long blade, I believe it is. I think it's actually exactly 15 and three quarter inches. That never changed. First thing that was changed was, again, the hooked quillion. Start seeing that in 1942 to 43 or so, they a number of the arsenals, at least, switch to a straight guard. Now, this seems to be, the, this little difference I'm going to talk about here, you can see a very slight variation in the two pommels. That doesn't seem to be a date-related thing as much as it is just a arsenal-to-arsenal -arsenal thing. It's a little more beveled. On this one for that matter it just is beveled on this example and on this example it is not the edges are more or less squared with the exception of that flat bevel on the sides so a little more rounded bird's head on the on this particular mid-war example and again there are 18 different variations so variations can be in you know uh, rivets versus screws screw that goes into a plate on this example and then on the last ditch example looks like on this one back to some form of a rivet and the wooden grips even change a number of times depending on exactly what variation you are looking at and uh, which of the 18 of which we're, we're mostly going over the the you know the big beats here which is you know early war mid war late war so Again, straight guard, and once they started doing straight guard, they didn't really stop. This example being the latest example of the three, still got the straight guard seen on the mid-war example. And again, with these even being the same manufacturers, they changed the manner in which the grips were affixed. And also, oddly, the grips on this one wrap all the way around, Whereas you see here, it is two pieces. I do believe this is still two pieces, but they meet in the middle. You can see what appears to be a seam. Now, the big things that you are probably noticing between the mid-war and late-war example. Uh, first off, we'll, we'll take a look down at this end here. Pommel was simplified to a simple square. You will see a version of this that they call a pole bayonet, where they don't even have a pommel, really. Uh, those are meant to be affixed to a bamboo pole, hence the term pole bayonet. And those, from what I've seen, can be pretty expensive. Generally speaking, it seems that people pay more for the last-ditch examples than they will for the earlier examples. Most of them are going to be closer to this first pattern, and then the later in the war you get... You know, there's not as many mid-war examples as there are early and pre-war examples, and there's even less last-ditch examples. The other big difference, and it's it's fairly obvious, is that they did away with what is often called a blood groove. I'm actually forgetting the technical term. I'll type it down, uh, just down here somewhere. But flat blade, no bevel very crude. And a lot of times uh, with these Japanese bayonets, they often did actually put an edge on these, whether that was done in Arsenal or in the field, I'm not certain, but every example of these that I've seen is edged from about mid blade to the end. All three of these examples actually are definitely edged. 
And the Japanese fighting doctrine in World War One and World War Two was definitely more melee heavy than any of the European powers or the U.S. even came close to being. The use of the bayonets with the Japanese was constant and quite dreaded by any, any writings that you see from anyone who fought in the Pacific against the Japanese will go on at length about how much the Western powers despised fighting hand-to-hand -hand, and the Japanese definitely seemed to revel in it and, and excel at it, honestly. But that about covers all that I've got for you guys today. Again, just some nice lineup we got, you know, early, mid, late war, type 30 bayonets. Happy to have access to all three of them. Bayonets are something that I've always been interested in, not to the same degree as the guns, but it's it's definitely uh, goes hand in hand with the gun collecting. So if you guys would like to see me do more bayonet talks, you know, let me know in the comments. I can definitely be arranged. We've got quite a few more. I always try and include some information on the bayonet when I do a rifle demo, but this with us having this lineup plus just the the influence that these had on British and American bayonets down the road it definitely I in my opinion was worthy of its own segment so hope you all enjoyed the video it's been Thomas with Great Northwest Weaponry and I'll see you guys next time